in Miami. Anybody been on a cruise? You've been on vacation on a cruise ship? Yeah. That's one thing you don't want to have to do. In fact, if you go on YouTube, there's all these uh, videos of people, they call them pure racers or runners, pure runners, and they're racing to try to make the boat, and some of them make it and some of them don't, and uh, when they don't, they're very sad. If you're on a cruise, you do not want to be left behind, because what's going to happen? You're going to have to, if your passport's back on the boat and you're in another country, you're going to have to go get a passport first, and then you're going to have to get an airplane to either the next port or to the you know, Miami or wherever you got on that thing. Usually, it is not a good thing to be left behind. Just ask this guy if you want to you know, think about this. I mean, when he got left behind, all kinds of bad things started happening, right? It's usually not a good thing to be left behind. So some of you, you might have uh, heard about my new book, and you read the title, I Want to Be Left Behind, and you're saying, Clay, is that a misprint? What are you talking about? Well... Getting left behind can be a good thing depending on the alternative, right? There's this guy named Seth MacFarlane, and he's an actor, an animator, uh, uh, animator a writer, a producer, a uh, director, a comedian, a singer. He's got a lot going on. And he's best known probably as the creator and star of the television series The Family Guy, or Family Guy. And so... Listen to him tell about how fortunate he actually was one day to be left behind. There you were. You were booked on the flight, I think, from Boston that hit the South Tower. Mm -hmm. And you didn't get on it. Why? Um, a combination of two things. I was, uh, I was giving a lecture at my college the night before and went out with some of the faculty afterwards and had, had uh, a, a few pints. <laughs> and, uh, so you got drunk. Yes. And... Uh, and a, a coupled with the fact that my, my travel agent had listed the, uh, the, the flight on my itinerary as leaving 10 minutes later than it did. And, and I, was, you know, I, was, I was generally late for flights. You know, I'd missed a lot of flights prior to that, so it wasn't, it wasn't like it was anything crazily out of the ordinary. But I, I got to the uh, uh, counter, and, and I said, yeah, I'm booked on flight 11. And, and uh, the one behind the counter said, oh, you know, sorry, you're too late. They just closed the gate. And I said, all right, well, you know, I'll take the 11 o'clock. Went into the lounge, uh, fell asleep, woke up about 45 minutes later to a, to a commotion. And the first plane had hit and sat there and watched the second plane hit. And they announced what flight it was. And I turned to the guy next to me and, and, uh, and said, my, my God, no, that, that was the flight I was supposed to be on. I, I was late. I missed it. I think if... Uh McFarlane had known what was going to happen, he would have said, I want to be left behind. Well, that's how I feel about the second coming of Jesus. And I'll explain why today and ongoing in this series and in this book, if you choose to read it. Today, as we kick off a new series for two months, the message is entitled, Who Gets Left Behind? How many of you have been to Israel? You've been over to the Holy Land? Some of you, some of you, we've been there together. And <clears throat> I've been there four times and hope to return someday. It's an amazing pilgrimage to walk where Jesus walked. It's not a safe time to go right now. And we pray for peace in that region as there's war on all sides, unfortunately. My first trip was with a group of pastors. And uh, we were up on top of the Mount of Olives, which is where you have the best view of the city. All the pictures that where you see the Temple Mount and the Dome of the Rock and all that. And we were going to walk down because at the very bottom is the Garden of Gethsemane. And as we were getting ready to leave, there was this guy standing there with a camel and he was offering pictures. You could get on the camel for a price and have a picture of you on a camel with the city in the background. And nobody was taking him up on it. So I walked over there and I said, hey, how much to ride that camel all the way down? And he goes, oh, we don't do that. And I said, oh, come on, nothing's going on here. I want to ride a camel. I've never ridden a camel. I've ridden a camel since then. But uh, he, uh, he, he said, well, you know, I don't, I don't know. So I pulled this umbrella out of my pocket. And the day before, it had been raining really hard. And when we got off our bus, all these people swarmed around us selling umbrellas. And every, everybody on the bus bought these umbrellas. But some of them didn't know about bargaining. And so they all paid different prices. I think I paid three bucks. One guy paid $17. 
and all in between. So I pulled out my umbrella and I said, you know what? This umbrella is worth $17. And he looked at it and he thought for a moment. And then he grabbed it and put it in a little pouch on the camel. And he said, get on. He got the camel down so I could climb on. You ever ridden a camel? You have. It's kind of like being in a rocking chair. The last trip we took to Israel, some of us, I'm pointing at you because we all rode camels together. But I'm riding this camel and he's leading it. We're going down the hill and uh, we, go, we go by this rock fence about halfway down and I look over the rock fence and there's a bunch of olive trees, a little olive grove there. And I thought, oh, that's cool. This is called the Mount of Olives and there's still olive trees growing here. And so the next day we had a little free time. So I put my Bible and a journal in my backpack and I hiked back up that road, found that wall, climbed over that wall, went out into that olive grove, sat down against one of those olive trees with a beautiful view of Jerusalem. I've since learned it probably wasn't legal or wise, but <laughs> for me, it was such a blessing because I pulled out my Bible and I turned to Matthew 24, which is often referred to as the Olivet Discourse, because Jesus spoke those words from that mountain where the olive trees were, looking down at the, the temple that then was still there. It hadn't been destroyed yet. And he told his disciples, not one stone is going to be left on top of another one. We'll look at that in more detail in this series. But as I'm reading through Matthew 24, I come to these words in verse 37 and onward. Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Now, some people stop right there and they say, it was really evil at the time of the flood, and that's why God cleansed the world and got our, you know, rebooted things. And so when it gets really evil again on this planet, then that means it'll be like the days of Noah and Jesus is going to come again. Well, you know, it's been really evil ever since sin entered this world, right? And <clears throat> what Jesus is saying is something different right here. If you look at it and listen to him, he says, for in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking and marrying and giving and marrying. In other words, they were going along doing normal day-to-day -day activities. They weren't expecting anything. And then suddenly it says, up to the day Noah entered the ark and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. So, here Jesus is saying things are just going like normal, and boom, judgment comes. And he said, that's how it's going to be. He goes on and says this, that's how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill, one will be taken and the other left. Now, there are those, and maybe some of you are in this category, who believe in a two-phase return of Jesus. A secret rapture, seven years of tribulation on this earth, and then Jesus comes back again for a thousand years and, and sets up his kingdom here on this earth for a thousand years. This, this is a view that is very popular in our, in our country and has been for some time, and I'll tell you how it originated in a moment. And this view uh, insists that someday, any time, people are going to just suddenly disappear. A rapture is going to happen, a secret rapture, and uh, believers are all going to disappear. And life's going to go on, but it's going to get bad. Because there's going to be this tribulation, there's going to be worldwide hardships and persecution and disasters and famine and war and pain and suffering. And Israel's going to rebuild their temple and start animal sacrifices again. During this time, the Jews are going to become believers in Jesus and the 144,000 literal Jews are going to become evangelists and it's going to lead to many conversions. And there's going to be both Jews and Gentiles getting converted, but there's going to be terrible stuff because the Antichrist is going to rise. He's going to shut down the temple sacrifices and start a war that culminates in Armageddon followed then by the return again of Jesus, who comes to reign on the earth for 1,000 years. Now, personally, from my Bible study, I do not believe in this two-phase return of Jesus theory. Some of you who were here uh, a number of years ago, a few years ago, uh, we were in Revelation for about 20 weeks. And if you tracked along with that study, you'll know uh, what approach I took for that. And I don't believe the Bible teaches this secret rapture, and yet I know many, many respected pastors and authors who do hold that view. Some of them are friends of mine. In my opinion, this is a secondary issue. It's worth studying and having an opinion on, but is not the main thing. 
Three years ago, I wrote a book entitled The Main Thing, and if it's available at the Connect Center if you don't have it and would like to read it. And it's on Galatians, and in that book, I assert uh, from the Apostle Paul's teaching that the main thing is the gospel of grace in Christ Jesus. Paul said, I resol resolved to know nothing among you, Corinthians, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And then later he said to the Corinthians, I taught you as of first importance the gospel. So if the gospel is the main thing, it's the first importance, there's other things that are second or third, or not important at all. And so when we come to these secondary issues that are not the main thing, we don't all have to see it alike. We can study and have some different views, okay? So if what I'm teaching, it doesn't track with what you think is the best interpretation of the Bible, I would uh, allow yourself to be challenged by what I'm going to teach and, and relook at what you've, you've thought. But if you hold on to it strong after that, good for you. Uh, you can do that. And the culture of Grace Place is that if we can agree on the main thing, we don't have to all agree on secondary issues. We can maintain a culture where we can agree sometimes to disagree, but hopefully not disagreeably. You with me on that? It's not the case in every church, by the way. There are churches where you better agree with the official position preached by the lead pastor on every topic, or you're not really welcome. That's not Grace Place, never has been, never will be. So if you don't agree with what I'm teaching today, Somebody wrote me a message this morning and saw that my book was out. They said, I don't like that title at all. I will read it, but I'm going to read it with my Bible open. And I said, please do. That's exactly what you should do. Read it with your Bible open and see what you think. But, but if you don't agree, we can still be friends. And listen, if I'm wrong, I'll be happy to admit it when Jesus comes and it's different than I thought. But I'm going to share with you what makes best sense to me. So those who believe in this secret rapture theory use Matthew 24 as one of the passages to support that view, specifically this idea that one will be taken and the other left. And they imagine planes and cars crashing as believers suddenly disappear and life goes on for those left behind. And they encourage you not to be left behind because although you would have an opportunity for a second chance, according to that view, um, after the rapture, nevertheless, it's going to be a terrible tribulation and it'd be good for you to avoid it. But what was Jesus actually saying with these words? Let's look again at them. Notice that right before he talks about one is taken and the other is left, he talks about the flood, and he said when the flood came, <clears throat> it took them all away. So the very context here of this passage is that those taken are taken to destruction, are taken to judgment. Those left are the ones remaining who are saved. Okay, and there's a number of places in scripture where this idea of the ones remaining, the ones left, are the ones that are safe, the ones that are saved. And, and in fact, if you look at the, the, how uh, the different gospel writers record things that Jesus said, they give us different um, ways of him saying the same thing. And in Luke, uh, Luke has uh, a little bit different approach here, same, same basic teaching of Jesus, but he says, just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. This is Luke 17, 26 and on. People were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. In Matthew's account, it says it took them away. That's, and here it says destroyed them. That's what it means, to be taken. You don't want to be taken. You want to be left. You don't want to be destroyed when Jesus comes. He goes on and says, it was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. Again, you, you notice he's not emphasizing wickedness. He's emphasizing normality of going about life. But the day Lot left Sodom, Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. And then this language. I tell you, on that night... Two people will be in one bed, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together, one will be taken, and the other left. And the disciples are listening to him, and they're tracking along with him. And their next question is very interesting. Because I believe what they're doing is they're saying, where will they be taken, those who are destroyed? Where? And that's what they say. They say, where? Where, Lord? They ask. He replied, where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. Whoa, that doesn't sound good. 
not exactly sure what he's saying there, but it reminds me of the end of uh, Revelation 19 where there's this description of Jesus coming as a conqueror, mighty, on a, on a white horse. And it says there at the very end that there's going to be a judgment and destruction of evil, of wickedness, of, wi of the wicked. And it says there that the birds gorge themselves on the flesh of those who died. Now, that may be symbolic language, but whether it's literal or symbolic, it doesn't sound good. Do you see why I say I want to be left behind? The ones taken are those who are lost. Those who remain, who are left, are saved. Now, some of you may have a question. How did this secret rapture view, also called dispensationalism by theologians, get started and become so widespread, especially in our country? And I'll give you a really brief history, okay? And you can study it for yourself if you want and, and go deeper on this, but it's often traced back to John Nelson Darby back in the 1830s. He was one of the founders of the, of the group called the Plymouth Brethren. And he's often taught, called the father of dispensationalism, the pre-tribulation rapture theology. And think about this. For 1,800 years, that, th that theology was not being taught. And then all of a sudden, it starts being taught. And... Uh, this view became popular because he was an evangelist and he traveled and he traveled to this country and others started to accept this view. And the way it became primarily popular in the U.S. in the early 1900s was because of a fellow by the name of Cyrus Schofield who wrote a reference Bible. It's called the Schofield Bible Reference or the Reference Bible. And in that, Schofield taught this dispensational theory, this secret rapture idea and promoted it. The famous evangelist Dwight L. Moody promoted dispensationalism. He went on to found Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, which became one of the two main schools, along with Dallas Theological Seminary in Texas, who taught this view to many, many pastors. And when the Jewish people resettled in the land of Israel in 1948, it was heralded by some as a fulfillment of prophecy. And since in the Bible, a generation is for, said to be 40 years, there were those who started saying that the rapture had to happen by 1988 or before because Jesus said in Matthew 24 that the generation that saw the signs he talked about would also see his return. And I'm going to, uh, we're going to look at that in, in a later message, what he was actually saying about that. But this led to all kinds of speculation, including a book. Maybe some of you saw this back in the day. It was called 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Happen in 1988. And I got to wondering this week. I'm imagining it's no longer a bestseller. But I got to wondering about it this week. So I went on Amazon and looked it up. And they had a used one on there for $1,085. So if you want it, it is available. I'm not sure who would pay anything for it. But nevertheless... During the 1970s, uh, this belief in the rapture became pos uh, popular in wider circles, due, uh, much, uh, due in part, but very much a part, <laughs> by uh, uh, books that were written by a man named Hal Lindsey, including the late great planet Earth, which sold tens of millions of copies. And then in 1995, the doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture was further popularized by Tim LaHaye's Left Behind series became 16 thriller novels. Some of you have read, some or all, and uh, sold close to 80 million copies. The teaser for the first book reads, an airborne Boeing 747 is headed to London when, without any warning, passengers mysteriously disappear from their seats. Terror and chaos slowly spread, not only through the plane, but also worldwide as unusual events continue to unfold. For those who have been left behind, the apocalypse has just begun. Later, there were movies made, uh, several, one starring Kirk Cameron in uh, 2000, one starring Nicolas Cage in 2014, and some video games, all kinds of, of uh, hype around it. Incidentally, for those who are interested, uh, the Left Behind books were all co-authored by a, a man named Jerry Jenkins, who just happens to be the father of Dallas Jenkins who is the creator and producer of The Chosen series that many of us are watching and been blessed by, for what that's worth. 
So there's just a little brief synopsis, a history uh, that reveals not only how the pre tribulation rapture view came into theology, but how it also came into pop culture. And it should be noted that the majority of scholars, historically and today, do not support this view, even though it has become as popular as it is, mostly in this country. Now, there's only one verse in all the Bible that talks about believers being caught up. The word rapture is not in the Bible, but the concept of being caught up is. And this verse that I'm going to take you to now, this passage, this, this, this extended passage in 1 Thessalonians 4, is used by uh, dispensationalists to teach this so-called rapture. And let's look, let's look at it, because I think it's really teaching the opposite. You see what you think. So we're beginning with 1 Thessalonians 4.13. It says, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Stop there for a minute and realize that there are different ways to grieve. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you know, and, and your spouse or your father, or your mother, or your relative, somebody is also a follower of Jesus and passes away, you know that they're in a better place. We talked about that last week, life after life. If you miss that, you might be interested in that. But uh, you still miss them. You still cry. God made these tear ducts for a reason, and, and it's okay to grieve. It's, it can ha it's, in fact, it's necessary. It's a part of a healing pro uh, process to grieve. But there's different ways to grieve. And if you've ever been around an atheist who just lost a loved one, which I have in a hospital, it is an unbelievable difference how a person who has no hope grieves. It's very sad because... It's not the way we, we need to be. So he says, I don't want you to grieve like those who don't have hope. He said, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Do you believe that? That's the main thing. That's the heart of the gospel. And that's the reason that we have hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. In other words, those who have already been with him after they died in the present heaven, as we talked about last week, He's going to bring them with him when he returns. He's going to bring, he's going to bring them with him. It says it right there. And uh, he keeps talking about here. He says, according to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. Now, this is interesting. There is going to be a generation, and wouldn't it be cool if it was us, that is never going to die, at least the believers, because they're going to be alive when Jesus comes back. And there's going to be a resurrection and new, new bodies for everyone who had already died. But for those who haven't died, 1 Corinthians 15 says there's going to be this, this instantaneous miracle, this metamorphosis. There's going to be, it, say, it says in the twinkling of an eye, it, it's in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we're going to be transformed, it says, and we're going to be, have glorified bodies. So you're going to be given a body if you're alive when Jesus comes that is perfect, that will never age. You'll probably be at your prime, whatever that was or is or might be. And you're going to live forever in this new body. It's going to be amazing. Wouldn't it be cool to be a part of that generation that, that, that never sees death? Well, it will happen to one generation. And this is what Paul is talking about here. And now he describes what it's going to be like when Jesus arrives. He says, for the Lord himself will come down. Notice it's the Lord himself. He's not going to delegate this. And when Jesus was departing from his disciples officially in Acts chapter 1, after 40 days of many appearances after the resurrection, he lifted up until he disappeared and his disciples were looking up and the angels appeared. A couple of angels said, hey, you guys, the same Jesus is going to come back in the same way that you've seen him go. The Lord himself will come down from heaven, and this is not going to be quiet or secret. 
Because it says, with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. There's a bunch of places in the Old Testament that talk about the second coming, the day of the Lord, with, with trumpet blasts. It's going to be loud. It's going to be spectacular. It's going to be dramatic. We'll study more about it in this series. It's going to be, it's going to be visual. Every eye will see him, Revelation 1.7 says. It's going to be like lightning from one end of the sky to the other end, Jesus said. It's going to be amazing. The voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. There's going to be a resurrection and a, uh, of those who have already died and they get their new bodies and there's going to be a transformation of those who are alive and they get their new bodies. It says, after that, we are, who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, here's the word that tells us about being caught, caught up right here. It's a Greek word. It's one word. And it's, a, um, it's an interesting word. It, the word rapture isn't in the Bible. That comes from a Latin word. This word is harpazo in the Greek, caught up. But in the Latin, it's rapier. And it's from that Latin word that we get our English word, rapture. There's nothing wrong with the word, but the word's not in the Bible. What it means in Latin is, is to seize. Jesus is going to ca catch up or, or seize or gather together his people into his presence. Matthew 24, Jesus speaks of of angels being sent to gather his people from all over the earth. Now, I want you to notice another word here. And this word is meet. We're going to meet the Lord in the air. Now, I'm pointing this word out because it's an interesting word. It's a technical word. And the Greek word, for those who care, is ap apansai. And, and pantes, and pantesti. See, I'm a Greek expert. You can tell, can't you? I took Greek for two years, and I still don't know Greek. But I do know how to use the tools, and you can use them too. And uh, you can go online, and you can type in Bible interlinear. And you, what you get there is a Bible that has every word in the New Testament in English with the Greek word underneath it and then the English pr pronunciation of the Greek word like this underneath that so that you can be clear on what it's saying. So this word is a technical term utilized to describe a delegation of citizens who go out to meet a dignitary who's arriving and escort him back into the city. These, these formal processions out and back were common in, these, in those times. There's many examples in the Bible that I could talk about, uh, one being the, the triumphal entrance of Jesus. You know, the Sunday before, Palm Sunday we call it, Sunday before the cross, the news gets out that he's coming as a king on a, on a donkey, and they come running out to meet him, this, this type of a meeting, and welcome him and escort him back into the city. Um, <clears throat> I think what Paul is, is wanting us to understand here is that the whole church in resurrected or glorified bodies meets the descending Lord and escorts him back to earth. It's a beautiful uh, thing to think about. This was something, by the way, that happened in Rome with the Roman emperors and generals and conquerors when they returned from conquest. The Senate would vote on whether or not to give them a formal triumph, they called it. It was the highest honor. They all wanted it. And some got it and some didn't. But if you go to Rome today and you go to the Colosseum, everybody goes there when they're in Rome. And you, there's, there's a big arch right there. It's next to it called the Constantine's Triumphal Arch. And if you walk into the Forum, you go out through a smaller arch, but very impressive. It's Titus's arch. And Titus was the general that conquered Jerusalem and destroyed the temple in 70 AD, which Jesus predicted in Matthew 24. And they built a, a, an arch to commemorate that. In fact, it even has... Um, in the carvings, there's people carrying a seven-branch candlestick out of the temple that you can see to this day, and that's from the destruction of Jerusalem. So these, these uh, generals and these uh, emperors were given triumphs, and so they would come in a procession with prisoners and with elephants and all kinds of of uh, all, their, all their army, and they'd be on a, you know, on a chariot, 
And there'd be banners, and it was a big deal, and people would come out to meet them and greet them and cheer with them as they would welcome them into the city. Now, I learned something this week. I either learned it or relearned it, because I might have learned it and forgotten it and relearned it. But nevertheless, it's not in my book, and it made me mad this week, because I would have put it in there if I, if I would have been thinking. But that's one thing I love is learning, and that's one thing I love about eternity is we're going to be always learning. If you're a person that likes to learn, now we're going to do that forever because there's a lot to learn because God is big, right? So here's what I learned. I told you how to use the interlinear. If you go on there, look up a verse, find a word, click on it. I mean, you can do this with the print version too, but it's easier online these days. Uh, so you click on that word, and it'll tell you every time that word is used in the New Testament, because it might not always be translated the same, but you can see how it's been used. Well, this particular word that I told you is a technical word, meat, here, is only used three times in the New Testament. And this is a part that I didn't put in my book. I was like, shoot. But the other two times where it's used, both times it clearly talks about going out, welcoming, escorting back. For example, Matthew 25, 6. Jesus told a parable of virgins who were told to go out and meet the bridegroom and usher him back to the banquet. And this is the word that's used, meet. So it's more than just greet. And then in Acts 28, 15, the apostle Paul is in chains. It's the very end of Acts. And he's being taken prisoner to Rome. And the word gets out to the believers in Rome. And when he gets off the boat, they come and they meet him and escort him back to Rome. And this is the word that's used. And so I believe that's exactly what Paul is intending for us to understand in 1 Thessalonians 4. It says there that we'll be caught up into the clouds, which is a symbol of God's presence. There'll be angels, God's people suddenly swept into God's presence. And I think it's very likely that, that this is a literal thing. Because Peter tells us, 2 Peter 3, that there will be a final judgment when Jesus returns and, and there will be a destruction of evil and sin. There will be a destruction of Satan and his angels and the wicked who have thumbed their nose at God and re rebelled and, and, and insisted on their own way. And it says there that the earth will be cleansed by fire. Wherever sin has gone, that evidence will be gone as God recreates a new heaven and a new earth. He's not going to blow up this earth. He's going to restore it. He's going to renew it. We're going to talk a lot about that in this series. It's exciting. But if God's going to use fire, sometimes it's used metaphorically in scripture, sometimes it's used literally. Let's just say it's literal. If God's going to use fire to, to clean up the impact of sin, I think I'd rather experience that from the air, looking down rather than on the ground. And I think that's what's going to happen. Now, Paul, and if some of this is new for you, I mean, keep coming, okay? This series is going to build on itself as we go through this. And uh, I'm not just going through this book chapter by chapter. I'm going to hit the themes of the first half because the second half is all about how we should live as we prepare for Jesus to return. And I think it's going to be, you'll find it encouraging and helpful. But the first half, uh, most of it is about what's going to happen to this earth and to those of us who are redeemed on this earth in the, in the age to come. And it's, I, I called the first half, uh, what God has planned is better than you think. And I hope you'll find it very encouraging. Paul continues to describe Christ's return here in the next chapter. In Philipp, or, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 3, the very next words, he says, Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. Why? Because we don't know the times and dates. Jesus said no one knows the time. Okay, so let's not focus on that. He said, For you know very well the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Now, this is another verse that is used sometimes to support the secret rapture view. They say, see there? It's like a thief. It's a secret. It's like a thief. But is that really what is being communicated? Jesus also used this terminology, and did Peter. This is Paul here. What were they trying to communicate to us? Were they trying to say that it will be a secret or that it will be sudden and unexpected? My parents live here in Berthoud, and they live over by the high school, a very well-lit area. But my dad had his truck a few years ago parked right next to his garage outdoors, locked, and someone stole it in the middle of the night. He went out there in the morning, it was gone. 
report it, they never did find it. He got another truck, and now he puts one of those little bars across the steering wheel in addition to locking it because somebody had the nerve to get in there somehow, get that thing started, and steal it. And, you know, the thief never warned my dad that he was coming. <laughs> a thief never sends you a postcard that says, hey, I'm, I just wanted to let you know I'm going to be working your neighborhood next week. <laughs> Doesn't happen. When Jesus returns, people will be going about life as normal. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them. What? Suddenly. Here's the emphasis. The thief analogy conveys the idea that the return of Jesus will be sudden and unexpected. But there's two analogies here. The thief illustration and labor pains. Here's another metaphor. Labor pains. Some of you know about that. It says destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. A woman knows the labor pains are coming, but not when. So each of these analogies communicate different shades of meaning about the coming of Jesus. The thief analogy communicates it'll be sudden and unexpected. And the labor pains, it'll be sudden and unavoidable. There's the big difference. Labor pains are sudden, but they're different because they are expected. In fact, the larger a lady's stomach becomes, the more comfortable we are in assuming that she's expecting. Of course, we never ask. <laughs> we just assume. I made that mistake at a young age once. I will never make it again. But we use the word expecting, right? So here's the difference between the thief and the labor pains. The idea of labor pains tells us the second coming will be sudden and unavoidable. When a thief comes, there is no warning. When labor pains come, there's no escape. And that's how it will be when Jesus returns. Sudden, no warning, no escape. Now I want to show you later in this series how I believe, along with early Christians, along with uh, most Bible students historically and, and, and today, that the return of Jesus is imminent. What does that mean? It could happen at any moment. We don't have to have a, a countdown. We don't have to be watching what's going on in Israel all the time and in the news and, and looking for certain signs. We'll, we'll study this, and uh, hopefully I can um, help you see this if you haven't already seen this. But, but, but imminent means it could happen anytime. It could happen right now. And so Paul makes this appeal in the, next, in the next words. He says this, But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. I'm hoping that that will be renewed in us as we go through this study, that we will be awake, that we will be aware, that we will be sober-minded as we wait expectantly for the blessed hope, as it's called, the return of Jesus is called the blessed hope in Titus chapter 2, verse 13, the return of Christ, the renewal of all things. The subtitle of my book is Finding Hope in the Return of Christ and the Renewal of All Things. And the, uh, the title is intended to be kind of an attention grabber. I've wanted to write a book with this title for many years, and I finally did it. Um, the book is available on Amazon for $16.99. It's also available on Kindle. And uh, the trustees decided to buy some of these and distribute them today for a suggested donation of $15. And so if you can't afford it, you don't have to pay for it. But if you can, you can help refund uh, the investment. And just so you know, I started a nonprofit three years ago when I wrote the main thing. It's called Main Thing Ministries. And I did that because I wanted to uh, write books through that. And um, I'm, not, I'm not making money off these. I did this for the church, basically. If other people want to get it, they can get it online. But uh, <clears throat> the way the nonprofit is set up is that uh, it's set up for writing books. And so I made enough on the, the other book to be able to do this. And we'll see what happens um, with this one. But uh, the, if for some reason it all of a sudden went big, 
and all of a sudden people just start buying it because I mean, people buy my other book from Japan and Germany and stuff. Just not very many of them, but just a handful here and there. But, but you know, everybody can get these around the world now. If for some reason it went big, the nonprofit is set up so that um, proceeds would go to orphan care ministries. Okay, so that's, so that, I thought you might like to know that story. So the remainder of this series is going to be especially focused on what happens here on earth when Christ returns. And I'm telling you, the good news is better than you think. Let's, let's pray. Father, thank you for the good news. Thank you for the hope that you've given us, this blessed hope. Thank you for the promise that you are going to return and, and that there's going to be a day of fairness and you're going to make all things right. We look forward to that and we want to be faithful to you each day as we live in preparation for that return. And now we turn our attention towards you, Jesus, and we just want to worship you for you are worthy and you are beautiful. Amen.